On December 15, the High Command, satisfied with the smooth progress of landing operations at Luzon, no longer deemed it necessary to patrol Legaspi waters and ordered our ships back to Palau. An American counteroffensive in the Philippines was written off at that time. While refueling at Palau, further orders arrived for us to escort landing vessels to Davao. At 7 a.m. on December 17, a convoy of 12 transports laden with an army regiment steamed out of Palau in three echelons. Seven destroyers and two small patrol vessels served as escort. The operation was commanded by Admiral Tanaka in cruiser Jinsu. Forty-five minutes after leaving Palau, I was standing on the bridge of Amatsukaze when my sonarman reported a submarine just 2,000 metres distant, bearing 80 degrees to starboard. This was almost an exact repetition of what had happened on X day. This time there was no hesitation. We closed to 1,000 metres, boosted speed to 21 knots, threw overboard six depth charges, then turning 230 degrees, we dropped another six. The charges were set to explode at 30 metres. We observed no indication on the surface of the effectiveness of our efforts. I resumed the escort position at the right wing in front of the second echelon of four transports, and the convoy zigzagged on at ten knots. At 1pm the same day, destroyer Kuroshio on the port wing of the first echelon reported, enemy submarine spotted. In cooperation with a friendly anti-sub patrol plane, we attacked it with depth charges, a large quantity of heavy oil floated on the surface. We consider the submarine sunk. This message was dismal news for us in Amatsukaze. I silently showed it to my officers. They groaned in disappointment. On December 20th, before daybreak, the convoy entered the quiet of Davao Bay without challenge from a single plane or ship. A landing operation was not new to me. My experience at Shanghai five years earlier had initiated me in enemy gunfire. Our orders at Davao were to hold fire unless challenged. We wanted to occupy the place intact, with a minimum of destruction. Two echelons had already landed successfully farther down the bay. The escort ships moved slowly into the port, which appeared quiet and peaceful. A platoon of my men shoved off from Amatsukaze in a small motorboat with the assignment of disarming and capturing small vessels at anchor in the port. Within minutes, some 200 troops suddenly emerged on the pier and opened fire on my men in the motorboat. A lookout shouted, Gunfire on boat! Some of our men appear to be hit. I shouted orders, Port guns opened fire. This was indeed a repetition of the Shanghai landing. A clumsy repetition for which I cursed myself, our six 120mm guns rotated and fired. None of the shells hit the enemy, some 2,000 metres away, but they scattered and fled. Second and third salvos followed. The pier was promptly emptied of troops. Cease fire, I ordered, but the fourth salvo was already on its way. One of the six shells hit a small oil tank some 50 metres from the pier, and it burst into flames. The developments in this operation were far from my expectations, I had repeated a series of clumsy mistakes. I was no longer a swell-headed destroyer expert, but a humbled, penitent man who was also disgusted with himself. The motorboat, meanwhile, returned with one dead. The following day I officiated at the funeral of Petty Officer Tsunio Hori, the first of my men to fall in the war. The oil tank burned on for three days and nights. For a week after the landing, we were kept busy rescuing Japanese residents of the area. Since Davao had the largest Japanese colony in the Philippines, it was too bad that this operation was so many days delayed. Fortunately, only a few had been killed by retreating enemy troops, and we freed from prison camps the Japanese who had been hurriedly rounded up at the start of the war. It was not long before word came of casualties inflicted on other Japanese destroyers. Ships which took part in the Wake Island operation evidently fared worse than we did at Davao, on December 11th, destroyer Kisaragi was sunk by U.S. marine planes based at Wake Hayate, a teammate of Kisaragi, was sunk the same day at Wake by marine shore batteries. How could they have been so clumsy? But others were still more clumsy, I learned. Destroyer Shino Nome hit a mine and sank at Miri Borneo. Highly classified reports said it was not determined whether the mine was Dutch or Japanese. I was infuriated to learn that destroyer Sagiri was torpedoed and sunk by a submarine, also off Borneo, on December 24th. A cat eaten by a mouse, how could a destroyer be so stupid? 
It was ascertained later that the successful submarine was the Dutch K-16. Destroyer Kuroshio of my own division, flushed with the achievement of sinking an enemy submarine, also managed to lose face. It was caught napping December 23rd, apparently in the belief that there were no enemy planes around, when suddenly one emerged from out of the sun. This B-17, a flying fortress, came in at low level to drop its bombs, one of which hit the ship and seriously wounded four sailors. These stories were never made public. They were buried deep beneath the spectacular Japanese exploits which were given wide publicity. When I learned of the losses, I could not help feeling worried. As has been said, war is a series of mistakes, but Japan could not afford mistakes. My mounting anger at such losses was changing me from the irresolute, wavering skipper of a month before to a new man, fierce and determined. Frustrations continued along with our successes in the early days of the war, and on January 4th, 1942, another occurred which was maddening to me. On that day, 14 major warships, comprising almost the entire Japanese surface force of the area, lay moored in the small harbour of Malalag, on the western coast of Davao Bay. The harbour mouth is quite narrow, and the commanding admiral of the fleet had ordered it closed with an anti-submarine net. I was eating lunch when the lookouts shouted, Air Raid! We looked up and saw nine land-based four-engine bombers at 30,000 feet. We knew these were enemy B-17 flying fortresses, because Japan's only four-engine bombers at that time were Kawanishi flying boats, Emily. Mess gear flew in every direction as officers and men scrambled to get to battle stations and into action. But what could we do? With the mouth of the small harbour closed, we were helpless. We could do nothing. Our guns would not reach the plane's altitude, and not a single Japanese fighter plane was airborne. I could only cross my fingers as the bombs came curving down. Fortunately, the American bombers, apparently new arrivals at Java, did not carry heavy bomb loads, and their aim was not good. One 250-pound bomb did score a direct hit on the number two turret of cruiser Moyoko in the centre of the harbour. More than 20 were killed and 40 others wounded. Splinters of that bomb reached seaplane tender Chitosa, moored 500 metres away, and damaged five planes on her deck. Not one Japanese plane was able to take off in time to pursue the raiders. My Amatsukaze was so near the beach we could not move an inch to evade the bombs. Luck alone saved us. I had never felt so miserable as on that day when I watched the 12,374-ton Miyoko, our teammate since X-Day, limping out of Davao Bay on its way back to Japan for repairs. We could not afford this kind of stupidity. In January 1942, I took part in the invasion of the Netherlands' East Indies, supporting the landing operations at Manado and Kendari. In both landings, there was little opposition from the local garrisons, but the poor quality of our air support was an ill omen for the future. The Japanese Navy did not have enough planes to cover our landings, and the few planes we saw were manned by second-rate flyers. Without proper training, they reported ghost ships that did not exist, bombed whales that they mistook for submarines, and even shot down our own transport planes in the confusion of air battles. My own experience in hunting submarines had been no more satisfying. On the night of January 31st, while escorting transports to a landing at Bill Bay on Ambon Island, I caught a submarine on the surface with my searchlight. We failed to hit with three salvos, and it got away. Regretfully, I signalled our failure to the other ships, warning that the enemy had probably escaped unscathed and might come back. I sweated out the next two hours, the enemy sub might choose our slow, troop-laden transports as easy targets. Our sonar watch was reinforced, but they picked up no further trace of the submarine. My uneasiness continued, however, until 1am when our convoy reached the landing point. The landing started at 1.20am on February 1st, with no pre-invasion bombardment from our warships. That was not in accordance with the original schedule. After my encounter with the sub, the enemy must have been fully alerted, and I was itching for a chance to bombard. I thought it meaningless to attempt an invasion against alerted enemy forces, with no pre-landing bombardment. Nevertheless, no bombardment orders came from the flagship, Admiral Tanaka explained to me after the war, that he had omitted bombardment, figuring that the ground opposition, even though alerted, would be weak. An even more binding reason, Tanaka explained, 
was that he had orders to conserve ammunition as much as practicable. That may sound ridiculous to Americans, but it was a grim reality to Japan. In the prosecution of that stupendous war, we were constantly reminded of the need for conserving. At the same time, we were experiencing American saturation bombings and massive pre-landing bombardments that were incomprehensible to us. Navy gunners were trained constantly to hit the target with opening salvos. Range-finding salvos, as used by Americans, were completely out of the question for us. That was an additional reason for my displeasure at the poor marksmanship of my gunners in shooting at the enemy submarine. The landing troops, as I had anticipated, were stopped at the beach by enemy ground fire. Commander Konosuke Ieki, in charge of the invasion troops, signalled at 2am, we are pinned down and the landing is thwarted. But he would not ask for support bombardment. On the bridge of Amatsukaze I squirmed with vexation. The situation was disgusting in every respect. At 3.20am, the landing troops finally signalled that the beachhead was secured. But there was more trouble ahead. At 5am they radioed, enemy fortress guns cover our flanks. Word came at noon by radio that Commander Yiki had been killed in action. It was ridiculous. Why did he have to die like that? A preliminary bombardment and continued shipboard fire support would have spared his life and many others. Stupid, stupid. That sad news was followed shortly by orders from Vice Admiral Raizo Tanaka, all escort vessels close beach to pick up casualties. Amatsukaze loaded 30 dead and 90 wounded. Meanwhile, the ground fighting was stalemated. We could not shoot now because of the confined ground situation. Japanese float planes from Tenda Chitose finally appeared early the following day and attacked the enemy's fortified positions. Still, there were no fighters or bombers from carriers Hiryu or Soryu. I simply could not understand why aerial cooperation was so inadequate. The seaplanes, coming in six at a time, were manned by brilliant flyers. They attacked enemy gun positions with telling effect. At one time, they tangled with five enemy bombers, apparently from the Dutch East Indies, and shot down two of them. No Japanese planes were lost. The Dutch-Australian garrison surrendered in the first evening of the invasion. February 1st, 1942. 200 garrison troops were taken prisoner. They told us that some 70 mines were laid at the main harbour on the southern side of Ambon Island. Our minesweepers spent a week on the hair-raising job of sweeping the narrow harbour. Three of them were hit by mines and sank with their crews, two days after the surrender. A transport moored near the mouth of the minefilled harbour signalled, ship under torpedo attack from seaward. And indeed it was, fortunately, none of the torpedoes found targets, but the alert sent me into action immediately. I figured that these torpedoes must have come from the very same submarine that had fooled me three days earlier. I was grimly determined to find and sink it. For five hours, sleek Amatsukaze chugged about at a snail like eleven knots. Our insensitive sonar gear would not function effectively if the ship moved any faster. An aggressive submarine could make an easy mark of such a slow target, even though it was a destroyer armed with deadly anti-submarine weapons. I thought of destroyer Sagiri, sunk by a submarine torpedo near Borneo in December. When a destroyer is patrolling, concentrating on spotting an enemy, it is fully on guard. If any sub was attracted by Amatsukaze, snailing at this tempting speed, I felt ready for it. But we picked up no trace of the submarine, as the slow hours stretched into five, the situation developed into a war of nerves. At 9.34pm, a sonoman shouted exultantly, Submarine, distant 2400 metres, bearing 10 degrees to port. I ordered, everybody to combat station, prepare depth charges, eight charges, set for depth of 50 metres, the sonar officer chanted in a calm, professional voice, Sub at 1800 metres, 40 degrees to port. The sub now at 1300 metres, 50 degrees to the left. It seems to be swerving to the left. Amatsukaze's course was adjusted to the new bearings. At 9.53pm, the sonar officer shrieked in dismay, lost track of sub, strangely calm at this news. I immediately judged that the sub had slipped into a blind angle. It and Amatsukaze must be cruising on an identical course. Japanese sonar in those early days operated on the principle of sending out sound waves and calculating an object's distance by checking the rebounding waves. These devices were not sensitive enough to pick up a sub's engine noises directly. 
My head was filled with calculations of bearings, angles and distance. The answer came almost reflexively. The sub is 180 degrees or dead ahead, moving at nine knots, now thousand metres away, at a depth of about 30 metres. I ordered speed boosted to 21 knots and looked at the second hand of my watch. I rapidly diagrammed the two ships' navigation curves. At 9.58pm, we released eight depth charges when I believed the enemy sub was directly below. I put Amatsukaze about and turned back, poised for another series of a depth charge attack. The surface of the sea gave off a strong odour of diesel oil in the dark night. We could see nothing. The smell of oil grew stronger. We were well aware of skunk tactics used by submarines under attack. By releasing oil while submerged, they try to induce pursuers to believe they have been sunk. We searched the site diligently for two hours, but picked up no trace of our quarry. I wrote the sub off as sunk, but there was no exultation in me. Four days passed and there were no other reports of the sub. It was obvious that I had scored a kill. I realised grimly that there is little real cause for elation in warfare. I learned a great deal from the Ambon operation, on the 9th of February, I returned to Davao, in escort of the transport Kirishima Maru, and carrying some of the wounded and dead who had fallen at Ambon. The voyage was uneventful. Peace and quiet was restored completely in Davao. Hostilities in the Philippines were now limited to Bataan Peninsula and Corregidor Island. Other scenes of war had moved far to the south. Davao had not seen an enemy plane in more than a month. Huge bundles of letters from home awaited us. There were also many packages and comfort kits sent by relatives and other friendly civilians in the homeland. On arriving at Davao, I enjoyed a long, leisurely bath for the first time in 20 days. When a Japanese destroyer was on combat assignment, even its skipper willingly skipped the luxury of a bath. I relaxed in my small cabin after ordering my crew to bathe and take it easy. The ship's store was ordered opened, it carried liquors, candy and toilet goods. Men were allowed to buy and drink liquor on board with the sanction of their skipper. Small as my cabin was, it was still the best quarters in the narrow ship. The six by nine foot space was filled with a bed, toilet equipment, a small round table, a wardrobe and a sofa and stool. On the table was a photograph of my family. Murata, a young sailor, delivered my mail, which included packages and letters. Did you receive your mail, Murata? Yes, sir, I did. He beamed, saluted and turned around. I opened a letter from my wife dated January 4th. She reported that the three children and herself were well and happy. A postscript, however, reported disturbing news. The day before yesterday, I took the children to Tokyo for a visit with relatives. Our maid was away, and when I returned to Kamakura, the door lock was broken and all our valuables were gone. That was distressing. My wife was from a good family and was totally unused to this kind of thing. In my anxiety about this, I downed several cups of sake, rice wine. There was a package from my eldest brother, who lived in Osaka. It contained a waistband with thousand stitches, handmade with crimson thread, a traditional Japanese charm against enemy bullets. My brother's wife wrote that she had stood at a downtown street corner to solicit 999 other women to contribute a stitch each to it. Gratefully, I put it about my waist, although I held no belief in the superstition. A letter from my brother contained further distressing news. His eldest son, Shigeyoshi Hashimoto, 25, a machine gun officer in the 4th Army Division, had died in December of tuberculosis. This nephew had been my favourite, I closed my eyes and mumbled a prayer for him. Feeling depressed, I stopped opening the mail, had a few more drinks and walked out onto the bridge. It was a lovely day. The harbour looked beautiful under the bright tropical sun. The duty officer sat gazing wistfully at the shore as I approached. He stood up and saluted. Announce that I am authorising shore leave tomorrow for all hands. They will be organised into three groups and each will have three hours of liberty. The lieutenant's eyes lit up with excitement, and he immediately started to spread the good word. Not one man in my crew of 300 had been ashore during the past 50 days, so the announcement was received with great joy. I returned to the cabin and opened another letter. It was from Kura, but the sender's name on the back of the envelope was unknown to me. The letter read, I am Hinagiku, one of the geisha girls, 
who served in the party before your departure to the war. I groaned. I, the father of three children, certainly had not anticipated a love letter from a geisha girl. The letter was filled with prosaic good wishes, which ended on a decidedly sour note. The landlady of the restaurant has reminded me that you forgot to settle the account before your sudden departure. We should be happy if you will pay the attached bill at your convenience. This certainly put me to shame. I was disgusted to realise that at my age I could be so shiftless. I had a sudden desire to get drunk and downed another bottle of sake. The last package was from Hiroshima, and I knew by the childish handwriting of its sender that it was a comfort kit. Japanese schoolchildren made these little gift packages on their own and sent them with a note to some unknown serviceman at the front. My package yielded a set of picture postcards showing the famed Hiroshima landscape, a sketch by the sender, a bunch of envelopes and a letter pad. An accompanying note read, I am a nine-year-old schoolgirl in Hiroshima. All of us schoolchildren here are studying hard. We sincerely pray you will fight hard for the sake of our nation. This was the only really heartening letter of the day. I stopped drinking and began writing replies, first to the unknown Hiroshima girl. My dear young lady, thank you very much for your very kind comfort kit. I am the commanding officer of a destroyer. I am grateful and happy to receive your sincere good wishes. The following day I went ashore with the first of my crew headed for their three-hour liberty. It was good to see that the streets of Davao had not been damaged. They were crowded with crews from other warships anchored in the harbour. Housewives of Japanese residents in the city had set up refreshment stands with signs reading, Please help yourself to coffee and tea. Served free by your fellow countrymen, Filipinos were also walking the streets peacefully. The girls with their elaborate hairdos and bright ribbons, and the men with brilliantly pomaded hair presented a gay picture. It was surprising for me to note, however, that most of them were barefoot. In Japan, no one walks barefoot on a city street. Anyone who can afford it owns a pair of shoes. Those who cannot wear wooden clogs. I was intrigued by the native scene. Theatres were showing the latest American movies to packed audiences. On side streets, I noticed a number of houses marked Japanese Military Recreation Center. Many sailors and soldiers were queuing up in front of them. These were brothels whose Japanese, Korean and Okinawan occupants followed wherever the Japanese military moved. I noted a sudden uneasiness among the men, obviously because of my presence. I said to my lieutenant, let's part here, I must go to headquarters, I'll meet you at noon. Caution your chiefs to count noses at the pier, aye, aye, sir, grinned the lieutenant. As we parted, the men shouted gaily, bravo, long live our skipper, on February 27th to 28th, 1942. I took part in the Battle of Java Sea. That action is worthy of note as one of the few major sea battles of World War II in which no planes were involved except for reconnaissance. Accordingly, it deserves a full description and analysis. There have been many books by both Allied and Japanese authors which purport to tell the story of this action. Most of the Allied books were written too soon after the war. The author's feelings seem still to have been running too high to permit objectivity and historical detachment. Nor do the Japanese books thus far impress me as being either objective or accurate. Part of this shortcoming is attributable to a lack of source documents, to be sure. But defeated and dispirited commanders are really not capable of giving objective accounts of their battles. Most of the commanding officers of the Allied ships in this battle were killed during the action, Therefore, it is not possible to reconstruct all the details of the Allied side. Rear Admiral Takeo Takagi, the top Japanese commander in the battle, was killed at Saipan in 1944. He was survived by his chief of staff, Captain Ko Nagasawa, later a top-ranking admiral of the new Japanese Navy, and Nagasawa's assistant, Lieutenant Commander Kotaro Ishikawa, who was Takagi's intelligence officer. Before writing these memoirs, I had long discussions with each of them, as well as other surviving officers involved in the battle. The Allied fleet made first contact with the Japanese convoy off Surabaya and reached out in an effort to destroy it. At the outset, the Allied column of three heavy cruisers, two light cruisers and eleven destroyers managed to box the 41 slow transports of the convoy, as well as its escort of ten destroyers and two light cruisers. The transports were loaded with a division of army troops, 
There were also two Japanese heavy cruisers assigned to this operation, but they lagged some 150 miles behind the convoy. With all their initial advantage of position and numerical superiority, the Allies failed to sink a single Japanese vessel in this encounter. Though the many errors committed by both sides seemed to offset each other, the really decisive factor, in my opinion, was morale. It is interesting to compare this battle with what took place at Leyte Gulf in October 1944. There the Japanese fleet, led by Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita, played an almost identical role to that of Dutch Rear Admiral KWFM Dorman's forces in the Java Sea battle. At Leyte Gulf, Kurita cornered four of the enemy's light carriers, slow and vulnerable, and could have dealt them a shattering blow. But he turned around at the critical moment and gave up a brilliant chance. That was exactly what the Allied fleet did in the Java Sea. Kurita went to Leyte with grim determination, but with full realisation that he had no chance of winning against the overwhelming forces of the enemy. It is important to note that psychological background before criticising his seemingly foolish reversal. In February 1942, a sense of hopelessness reigned among Allied officers at Surabaya. They saw little or no chance of survival. The Allied fleet of 15 fighting ships was licking its wounds. All these ships knew that they were likely to face a real showdown within a week. Allied commanders recalled the Pearl Harbour attack and the sinking of Prince of Wales and Repulse two months earlier. They had almost refused to accept the news at first, and there was still disbelief in their minds. But facts piled on facts. Singapore had just fallen. Complete occupation of the Philippines appeared imminent. The Japanese were surging to the south, reducing one outpost after another. The Imperial Navy's mighty task force, commanded by Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, was known to be moving in the waters of the South Pacific. It appeared to enemy eyes as a mammoth super armada. They simply had no way of knowing just how huge it was, or how many carriers Japan had. This confusion sprang in part from the fact that the enemy could not tell whether attacking Japanese planes came from carriers or land bases. The massive air raids on the Philippines, carried out a few hours after Pearl Harbor, were believed to have come from Japanese carriers. Actually, the planes came from Formosa. A series of bomber attacks over Java were also carried out by land-based Japanese planes from Jolo, Balikpapan and Kendari. To Allied officers at Surabaya, these planes appeared to have come from Japanese carriers in the Java Sea. On February 1st, a small American task force attacked the Marshall Islands. Nagumo's task force promptly rushed out from Truk on a 1,500-mile sortie to the Marshalls. Allies at Surabaya, hearing of this movement, thought it was now safe to go out and attack the Japanese. Their four cruisers and seven destroyers steamed to Balikpapan, hoping to repeat the achievements of Commander Paul Tolbert. The Japanese were not napping this time. Sixty Japanese bombers and fighters, which had come from Formosa to Kendari, swooped down on February 4th and damaged the Allied fleet. These ships limped back to Surabaya, stunned by what they believed to have been carrier-borne Japanese planes. The whole affair was a nightmare to them. On the 19th, another event impossible in the eyes of the Surabaya headquarters occurred right over their heads. Allied intelligence reports said the Nagumo task force had turned before reaching the marshals and was headed toward Australia. Early that morning, Nagumo hurled 188 bombers and fighters in a devastating raid on Port Darwin. About noon the same day, 23 Zero fighters swarmed over Surabaya and shot down 40 Allied fighters, mostly P-36, in a brief air melee. Even if the intelligence man at Balikpapan had reported accurately that these Japanese Navy fighters had flown 450 miles from Formosan bases, the Allied officers would probably not have believed it. They were all convinced that the Zeros were from carriers. Later that same day, a group of Japanese bombers from Kendari struck a secret enemy airfield at Jombang, near Surabaya, and destroyed P-40 Buffaloes and British Hurricanes based there. Japanese combat planes were fast gaining respect in the eyes of the enemy. It was no chance thing that Britain's proudest battleship had fallen victim to their attack. The same fate could meet any of the remaining ships at Surabaya. Against this background, the commanding officers at Surabaya on February 20th 
mulled over the latest reports that two massive Japanese convoys were heading toward Java. One convoy of 41 transports with some 20 escorting warships left Jolo for Surabaya on February 19th. The other, with 56 transports and 15 escorts, had left Cameron Bay, Indochina, two days earlier, heading for Western Java. The high command at Surabaya must have been in agony. If the Allied fleet went out to tackle one of the Japanese convoys, it might win a battle, but it would not then have a chance of defeating the second convoy. The most difficult factor for the enemy, however, must have been the unpredictability of Nagumo's mighty task force. It might turn up at any moment to swing its sledgehammer blows at the Allied fleet, now devoid of air cover. Meanwhile, Japanese planes were able to come and go at will. At the Japanese High Command, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, Commander-in-Chief of the Imperial Combined Fleet, had met with his staff officers on February 17th aboard battleship Nagato, moored at Hashirajima near Kure in central Japan. He had already ordered Nagumo to turn around and hit Port Darwin without pursuing the small American task force. We must secure oil and other resources of the Dutch East Indies, that is of higher priority than pursuing any small American force. Yamamoto doubtless had in mind the outline of his forthcoming midway operation. When his staff had studied all intelligence data and reported to him, Yamamoto concluded that the Allied surface fleet in Surabaya was no potential threat to Japanese actions, and he ordered the two convoys, each carrying an army division, to weigh anchor. The landing operation does not require the support of a major task force, Yamamoto ruled. So Nagumo pushed 220 miles north of Port Darwin on February 19th. On February 20th, Yamamoto held another staff meeting. It was decided that the Allied fleet was completely demoralised and no longer in shape to attempt any major action. Yamamoto cancelled his earlier plan of using land-based planes as air cover for the Japanese convoys. Nagumo was ordered to the Indian Ocean to sink Allied warships expected to be fleeing from Surabaya. This audacity resulted in jeopardising the operation of at least the convoy which I escorted. The 41 transports were in two columns, 600 metres between ships and 2,000 metres between columns. They zigzagged sluggishly at ten knots. The formation was spearheaded by four minesweepers on a line of bearing with 3,000 metre intervals, followed at 3,000 metres by three destroyers similarly spread. Then came cruiser Naka, the flagship, flanked by two small patrol ships. One destroyer to port and one to starboard guarded the middle section of the long transport columns. Another escort group, consisting of Destroyer Division 2, which included my Amatsukaze and three other destroyers, led by Rear Admiral Raiso Tanaka's flagship Jinsu, was in position farther out on the port side. This group had taken part briefly in the Timor Island landing operation after Ambon, and we had joined the convoy at Makassar on February 25th. Two heavy cruisers, Nachi and Haguro, followed haughtily behind the convoy at a distance of some 200 miles. The 20-mile-long convoy was quite a spectacle. An obvious laxity prevailed in the transports with their ill-trained crews. Many transports emitted huge clouds of black smoke from their funnels, Many used their radios in violation of no transmission orders or failed to observe blackout rules at night. Enemy submarines could have had a field day against such easy targets. Most disturbing, however, was the dreadfully slow pace of the trailing heavy cruisers, the only ships of the force which packed a real punch in case the enemy fleet chose to attack us. The weather was beautiful, sparkling sun by day, and bright moonlight silvered the sea every night, even at night, trained eyes could span the length of the entire force. Five Allied submarines had been observed by our reconnaissance planes, but none menaced our ships. To this day, I do not understand why enemy submarines failed to come out. On the morning of the 26th, the sea south of Borneo was calm. I awakened from a brief nap and pored over the latest information. Our reconnaissance planes and intelligence agents reported a formidable minefield all along the Surabaya coast, adding to the hazard of many sunken ships. The reports also said the Allies are still flying bombers, including some B-17 recently arrived from Africa and fighters at Malang and other small strips. The situation certainly did not warrant all our optimism. 
At 8am, a PBY Catalina floatplane suddenly slipped out of the clouds to the southeast and headed toward my ship. Enemy plane dead ahead. Open fire, I yelled. An anti-aircraft machine gun fired one burst as the PBY dropped a bomb a bit too early, which raised a large water pillar about 500 metres ahead. The plane swerved, gained speed and disappeared into the overcast. The whole action was so brief that we didn't even have time to get excited. This was most unusual. The more I thought about this awkward attack, the more puzzled I was. If the plane was on reconnaissance, as it must have been, it was foolish to have made its presence so obvious. It was still more ridiculous for the plane to drop just one bomb at a destroyer. A transport would have been a much more profitable target. In a way, it was good to know that the enemy was aware of our operation. A lookout called attention to a big white ship to port heading in our direction. Using large binoculars, I saw what appeared to be a hospital ship of about 4,000 tonnes. Its presence in this area was the second puzzle of the day. We hoisted flags, ordering it to stand by for inspection, and sped toward the ship. Through binoculars I watched a small elderly man, apparently the ship's skipper, on deck, hastily putting on a uniform. His hands were shaking and he appeared very nervous. As we closed I read the name Optonote, and our ship register confirmed that it was a Dutch hospital ship. Lieutenant Goro Iwabuchi and six armed petty officers rowed over in a boat and boarded the ship. An hour later, they returned to report some 15 doctors and nurses on board, in addition to the crew. I asked for instructions, and Admiral Tanaka replied, Even a hospital ship is objectionable in this area. Take it to the rear to anchor among our supply ships. I spent all morning chaperoning the hospital ship. After handing it over to the care of the supply squadron commander, I rushed back at 26 knots and rejoined the escort at 2.15pm. A few fighter planes from Balikpapan flew cover over the convoy. They came after the PBY had attacked us and stayed overhead until about 7pm. By that time a cool breeze had sprung up. I lit a cigarette and asked the navigator the time of sunset. Lieutenant Toshio Koyama answered that the sun would set at 7.48pm. My smoke was interrupted by the staccato sound of anti-aircraft guns. Seeing that cruiser Jintsu was firing, I ordered... Battle stations, air attack. Looking up, I saw two B-17 bombers coming out of the cloud deck some 4,000 metres high and yelled, Open fire! The 12.7 centimetre guns swung up to 75 degrees, but still could not bring the planes into range. The smaller guns were completely ineffective, but they fired as if their noise might scare the bombers. The B-17, apparently from Java, dropped six 500-pound bombs, Four of them fell about 1,500 metres to starboard of Amatsukaze. Two hit the water some 500 metres on destroyer Hatsukaze's port hand. Poor marksmanship, the bombers attacked our fighting ships, instead of troop-laden transports. That meant that the enemy wanted to knock out our fighting ships, so his fleet could tackle the whole convoy. This was alarming, and I felt braced for the challenge. The morning hours of the following day, February 27th, were uneventful. Our crew continued with routine training. Then, at 11.50am, just when everyone was ready for lunch, four big bombs exploded without warning. Huge columns of water rose about 200 metres ahead of destroyer Yukikaze, cruising 3,000 metres to the right of my ship. The preceding day we had seen the bombers before they attacked. Today we were caught unawares, and belatedly I again discovered two B-17 flying just below the 4,000 metre cloud cover. The flying fortresses had certainly achieved surprise. It was only inept bombing that spoiled their chance. Their aiming again at the highly manoeuvrable warships puzzled me. Why didn't they hit at the sluggish transports? One hit by a 500-pound bomb could easily have sunk a transport and disrupted the whole Japanese schedule. Today, years after the battle, I still believe that was a big mistake. Japan also made a serious error in launching this operation without sufficient air cover for the surface forces. But that mistake was offset by the ineffective and unwise tactics of the Allied planes. Ten minutes after the B-17 encounter, the convoy altered course 90 degrees for Surabaya. Until then we had been heading westward in a faint movement. We were already 60 miles north of Surabaya. Soon afterward a Japanese scout plane from Balikpapan flashed a report. 
Five enemy cruisers and six destroyers, 63 miles 310 degrees from Surabaya at 12 p.m. This force is heading on an 80 degree course at 12 knots. Nachi, 12,374 tons, one of the two heavy cruisers following us far to the rear, immediately catapulted its scout plane to maintain contact with the enemy fleet. The fleet was surprisingly near and apparently headed toward us. Was it coming to fight us? We waited uneasily for further scout plane reports. Two long hours passed. At 2.5pm, the Nachi plane radioed that the enemy force of five cruisers and ten destroyers was continuing on the same course. With two of our cruisers 150 miles to the rear, the enemy fleet was definitely more powerful than our escort. Admiral Takagi ordered the transports to turn northward. I no longer felt the tropical heat, cold sweat ran down my back. We had blundered into a trap. If the enemy picked up speed immediately, he could easily tear our convoy to shreds and sink the transports like clay pigeons. I shuddered at the prospect. The two forces drew steadily closer, and I wondered why the enemy fleet still cruised at a mere 12 knots. At 3.10pm, Nachi's scout plane radioed an amazing message. The enemy fleet has turned around and is headed towards Surabaya. Admiral Takagi on Nachi's bridge laughed. The enemy ships were merely staying clear of our air raids on Surabaya. The enemy is in no shape to fight us. We will stick to our original plans and schedule. The force will turn and head south again. At 4.30pm there was another surprise message from the Nachi scout plane. The enemy fleet has turned around again. The double column formation is now shifting to single column. The enemy is gaining speed and is headed on a course of 20 degrees. Ten minutes later, another message came. The enemy speed is 22 knots. It is heading directly for our convoy. There was no longer any doubt about the enemy's intention. I checked the chart and found that the distance to the enemy fleet was 60 miles. If both sides ran at 20 knots, we would meet within an hour and a half. Takagi, suddenly glum and angry, ordered the transports to turn around once again. He also ordered the cruisers to catapult their observation planes and the escort ships to line up into fighting formation. Cruisers Nachi and Haguro belatedly began to pick up speed. My flotilla quickly formed in a column cruiser Jinsu, followed by the four destroyers. The transports turned around and fanned out. Their movement was painfully slow. They were mostly requisitioned merchant ships, and their crews were untrained. It was distressing to watch their disarray. Many were baffled at the repeatedly changing orders, and they were unable to respond quickly. Most irritating of all was the slow arrival of Nachi and Haguro. They were so many miles to the rear. Each of these two heavy cruisers packed a punch equal to that of ten destroyers. Without them I did not see how we could fight the powerful enemy fleet. If the enemy increased speed to 30 knots, they might arrive at any moment. If that happened, what could we do? At 5pm, the chaos subsided as the transports resumed an orderly formation escorted by patrol ships and minesweepers. Behind our flotilla, four other destroyers formed up. The other flotilla, consisting of cruiser Naka and seven destroyers, brought up the rear. The Japanese warships now sped at 24 knots, ready to fight, I scanned the horizon as we cruised around the two-mile-long column, but found no trace of our two heavy cruisers. I mumbled profanely in my vexation, Enemy ship! shouted Warrant Officer Shigeru Iwata, who, gifted with amazing eyesight, was the chief spotter on the bridge. I looked where he was pointing. I saw several masts to the south. They soon became visible to everyone on board. From pictures I had studied, the masts were clearly recognisable as belonging to the Dutch cruiser De Reiter. De Reuter is distant 28,000 metres, about 20 miles, Iwata chanted. It is closing rapidly. I turned around. Nachi and Haguro were still not in sight. There was, in fact, nothing to be seen but the many Japanese transports, sluggishly fanning out behind us. I shouted, Gunners and torpedomen, get ready. Our target is the lead cruiser in the enemy column. All noises in my ship were suddenly hushed. We were heading for our first major sea battle. The silence was broken by Iwata's voice. Commander, look, Nachi and Haguro there. I looked around and saw the long-awaited cruisers on the eastern horizon. They were far away, but could make it. Good. I nodded. The time was 5.30pm. 
The enemy ships suddenly altered course to the west and began running almost parallel to us. This was another puzzling development. The enemy must have seen our column formation. Why did he refuse to go straight ahead? By staying on his original course, the enemy could have chosen broadside targets while keeping himself only thinly exposed to Japanese gunfire. That enemy movement again enabled us to gain time. Admiral Takagi leapt with joy when he saw the enemy, still 36,000 metres distant, swerving to the parallel course. Now I can catch up with our fleet, he yelled. At 1746-546pm, Takagi's battle orders were issued, deploy in three columns and head on course 170 degrees south. One minute later, cruiser Naka opened fire at the enemy 22,000 metres away, too far for its 14-centimetre guns. Realising the mix-up, Takagi hurriedly changed his orders. Keep course parallel to the enemy. Cruiser Jinsu and her four destroyers swung out and moved some 10,000 metres along the western course of the force. Jinsu fired its six 14-centimetre guns at Doraita, 18,000 metres away. The shells were wasted. The four destroyers watched glumly. At that distance, their 12.7-centimetre guns were also useless. Nachi and Haguro started shooting their 20-centimetre guns from a distance of 25,000 metres. Their shells were equally ineffective. The Allied fleet swerved again gradually to the southwest, increasing the distance from our ships. The enemy guns were now blazing, but the distance was also too great for them. All their shells were wasted. At 6.5pm, Rear Admiral Shoji Nishimura, commanding Destroyer Squadron 4, apparently lost patience with the ineffective gun duel over a widening distance. Nishimura's cruiser Naka and his seven destroyers released 43 torpedoes at the enemy, then estimated to be more than 15,000 metres distant. The oxygen torpedoes, pride of the Imperial Navy, could run 40,000 metres at a speed of 36 knots, but released at such a distance even they could not be expected to hit moving targets except by sheer chance. Of these torpedoes, a dozen or so blew up after running a few thousand metres. There is no explanation of why they exploded. It may have been a mechanical failure, or perhaps some of them collided and their explosions induced the others to explode. The other torpedoes went on but hit nothing. They too were wasted. Allied officers must have been astounded at the range and spread of these torpedoes. It must have been quite nerve-wracking. After the torpedo attack, the Allied fleet turned sharply to the south. At 6.27pm, eight Allied planes appeared. They flew on some 20 miles ahead of us and headed for our transports. About a dozen Zero fighters, which had been called in from Balikpapan at the time our escort ships had deserted the convoy, gleefully pounced on the enemy bombers. All of the enemy planes were shot down before they released any bombs at the Japanese transports. This attempted enemy air attack was yet another puzzling development of the day. It was cloudy with a lowering sun piercing the clouds from time to time, but dusk was fast approaching and sunset would be at 7.50pm. By 6.33pm, Admiral Takagi determined that we were merely wasting ammunition and the possibility was growing that the enemy might flee under the dark of night if we continued the battle in that fashion. He ordered all ships to close and charge the enemy. The enemy fleet had again turned to starboard and was now heading due west. The Japanese ships also turned to the west, with guns blazing. Four minutes later, British cruiser Exeter was afire, causing sudden confusion in the enemy formation. The enemy ships promptly emitted thick smoke screens. It was later learned that a 20-centimetre shell from Nachi or Haguro had hit Exeter's powder magazine. Exeter, in second position in the Allied column, lost speed rapidly. In slowing, she swung to the left out of column and barely avoided collision with following American cruiser Houston. An amazing development followed when Houston also swerved to the left and all the following ships did the same. Flagship de Reiter alone continued straight ahead and it was a few minutes before she discovered that the rest of the column had turned off. In turning around to rejoin them at full speed, she almost collided with a destroyer. This sudden chaos in the Allied formation enabled us to close, and eight Japanese destroyers, including mine, went dashing in at 30 knots. The Allied fleet reformed, leaving the limping Exeter behind, and the guns of every ship were levelled directly at us. At 7,000 metres from the enemy fleet, 
Destroyer Tokitsukaze, a little ahead of Amatsukaze, took a shell hit. Amatsukaze was enveloped by thick white smoke bursting from Tokitsukaze, which blinded us. Shells rained all around, raising water pillars on every side, but still none reached my ship. I gritted my teeth and made a dogged dash as the enemy shells came closer and closer. I had to continue if I was to release my torpedoes effectively. The enemy was heading northwest, directly toward us, in his first aggressive operation of the day. Six thousand metres to the enemy now, sweat streamed down my face as I grasped the bridge railing. Not yet, wait, we must close to at least five thousand metres. Enemy shells were falling close and could hit my ship at any moment. At 7.27pm, Rear Admiral Raizo Tanaka ordered his cruiser to release eight torpedoes. When Jinsu's fish swished out of their tubes, I could hardly restrain an order for gunfire. A near miss dashed water on my face. My knees shook and my arms trembled at the time. I grow quite uncomfortable when I think of it even now. I was not worried about being a coward, but was concerned that my cool judgment might vanish, being under the fire of enemy ships for the first time. I saw sixteen more torpedoes spring into the water from Yukikaze and Tokitsukaze. At this I gave in and yelled, Fire torpedoes! Four other destroyers followed Amatsukaze's lead. I calculated the chances of a hit very slim at 6,000 metres, perhaps less than 5%, three hits out of the 72, I figured. How wrong this proved to be, the enemy fleet made a rapid turn to the west, and I saw that at least half of our torpedoes would pass beyond the enemy bows. The rest of the fish reached the area of the targets, but all seemed to have missed, when suddenly there was a tremendous flash. Dutch destroyer Cortenaire was hit and sank instantly, one hit out of 64 shots. What poor aiming and how excellent were the enemy's evasion tactics. Rear Admiral Shoji Nishimura's cruiser, Naka and his seven destroyers, arrived presently and also released 64 torpedoes. The enemy again swung 90 degrees, this time to the north, in an unorthodox, fantastic movement, and all 64 of these torpedoes were wasted. The enemy then took two more 90-degree turns, and the whole column turned around in a thick smoke screen. Such tactics were not to be found in the Imperial Navy manual. I just stood and gaped. An enemy shell hit destroyer Asagumo, killing five and wounding 19, disabling its engine for a time. After the torpedo release, our second squadron and Naka's fourth squadron drew their courses in looping curves and turned in a complex movement. The distance to the enemy fleet was steadily expanding. Our chances appeared to be lost. However, Allied behaviour on this night was really inscrutable. After having made a 360-degree turn, the enemy had apparently turned heel and run under the thick smoke screens. But the Allied fleet then made two more rapid 90-degree turns, and headed back straight to the north. The enemy intention remains a mystery. Perhaps they still wanted to make a drive against the Japanese convoy. Japanese cruisers Nachi and Haguro, trailing far behind the two destroyer squadrons, saw the enemy and turned around. At about 8pm they released 16 torpedoes at a range of 16,000 metres. The distance was too great. The Allied fleet again made a 360-degree turn, and all these torpedoes were also wasted. The enemy fleet sped at full steam southward towards Surabaya. The Japanese cruisers would not chase. The staff officers uneasily watched a series of about 12 explosions to the south. They had no idea what the explosions were, and suspected that enemy submarines were attacking the Japanese destroyers. It was later ascertained that these explosions were simply their own torpedoes, which had travelled 40,000 metres to the south, hitting the shore. In the gathering darkness, we could also see the Surabaya lighthouse, just 20 miles away. At 10.30pm, Takagi ordered all ships to break off pursuit and gather near the transports. The battle was indeed a series of blunders made by each side. 